So now we look at, at how to perform basic data summaries for Boston housing with Excel for Mac. As I've already said, Excel for Mac, unfortunately, the latest versions do not have the data analysis tool pack. If you're using an older version that does have the data analysis tool pack, then your work will be pretty similar to what I had shown earlier for Excel for Windows. But if you're going to be using uh, data summaries with uh, with Apple uh, with Excel for Mac 2011, then I had already told you that you need to download and install Stat Plus. I had shown it to you on an earlier slide. So what you want to do is to the way this process works is a little crazy. It looks a little crazy. It doesn't doesn't look like it's right. Uh, so first you run Stat Plus, and when you run Stat Plus, nothing seems to happen. The application just starts. Let it be. Okay. Let Stat Plus start. Let it be. Then you open Boston Housing, the file bostonhousing.csv or bostonhousing.xlsx, whichever one. Open it in Excel. Then switch to Stat Plus. Select Statistics. Basic statistics and tables, descriptive statistics. That will bring up a particular window. And in that window, there is a box called variables. Your cursor should be already in that box. If not, click in that variable box. Okay. Then, with the cursor in that box, just switch over to Excel where you've got your Boston housing data loaded and select the entire data. Select the whole, all the 15 variables, all the 506 rows. Okay. Now, what happens is that through inter-process communication in Apple, the selection that you did is actually filled up. The range that you selected is filled up in the variables box. So now when you go back to Stat Plus, you will find that your range is actually filled up in Stat Plus. And then you click OK. And then wait a little bit. Don't do anything on the system till this process finishes. Okay. So this process will finish and the results will appear in a separate Excel window that Stat Plus creates. That window will have some kind of data summaries. Once again, the data summaries are a little bit different from what Excel shows or from what R shows, but fundamentally, the same sort of information is still available. So that is how you would do data summaries with Excel for Mac and using Stat Plus. Okay, Stat Plus is not as pretty as data analysis in Excel. But it does several things. It does the basic summaries. It does some correlations. It does some histograms. It does certain things. OK, so now let's turn our attention to some actual analysis or actual understanding of what is there. The first thing we want to look at is, OK, we've already looked at measures of central tendency, mean, median, and mode. Now, there are also other things that you would like to understand about data and that's called measure of location. In other words, you want to find out how are the values actually distributed. Okay, So it, it may not always be the case that you've got a maximum and minimum and the values are uniformly distributed between maximum and minimum. That may not always be the case. In fact, often it is not the case. Okay, So we want to understand that a little bit better. So you've got measures of location. So here I've just cooked up some, some data on something price okay in fact if you go to uh, the file called percentile dot xls and percentile dot csv you actually have this data available for you okay so here you go to this and then you'll see that once you perform within excel data data analysis rank and percentile the data analysis uh, option has something called rank and percentile. If you do that, and if you supply this particular range as an input to it, it's going to show you the percentile. Okay. In other words, what it's telling you, what this means is that 100% of the values in the data file, in this case, of course, our data file is very small. It's got only about 10 values. So it says that 100% of the values are less than or equal to 159. That is because 159 is the maximum value. Rank is 1. Okay, And then it says 88.8% .8 of the values are less than or equal to 155 and so on. That's what percentile indicates. Okay, So percentile tells you what percent of the values in the file are less than or equal to a given value. 
Okay. Now the summary scene in Stat Plus, the summary screen in Stat Plus, if you perform the summary as I had showed you earlier, that also gives you an idea of the percentile. It doesn't tell you all the percentiles, but it tells you certain levels at the percentile that we'll talk about shortly. Okay. So what this is telling you, the percentile field as I had described earlier is telling you what percentage of observations are equal to or give below a given value. So for example, if you take this, what it tells you is that 55.5% of the values are equal to or less than 110. Okay, which means 110 is roughly at the 55th percentile. And 102 is roughly at the 33rd percentile. Okay, it's falling somewhere at the middle one third. Uh, it's falling at the 33 percentile level. That's what percentile means. Of course, we are all familiar with percentiles. If we have taken competitive exams like SAT or GMAT and so on, they say, well, he scored a 98 percentile, which means that the score that a particular person obtained was 98% uh, of the people obtained a score less than or equal to that particular score. That's what the 98 percentile means. Or alternately, only 2% of the people scored higher than you. So if you scored at a 99 percentile, that means only 1% of the people scored above you. That 99% of the people had scores either equal to you or below you. That's what it means. That's the meaning of percentile. And it gives a good idea as to given a particular value, where in the entire range does it stand in terms of the distribution. Okay, so again, now use the file percentile.xls or percentile.csv. And if you use the XLS X file, use the percentile example worksheet. That file has a couple of worksheets, so use that one. So from this, find the values at the first quartile, median, and the third quartile. Now, essentially, first quartile means the 25th percentile, meaning which value is at the 25th percentile, which value is at the 50th percentile, median is basically the 50th percentile, and which value is at the 75th percentile. Those are the first quartile, median, and the third quartile. Okay, you can use Excel or R, R commander rattle, because you already saw that the data summary in uh, Excel as well as in R uh, both show you the various quartiles. We hadn't discussed it at that point, but they show you the various quartiles. So you could do the data summaries as we did earlier and arrive at these values. Okay, so let's see. Uh, at this point, I hope you'll stop, do the work, and then proceed with the recording so that you get, a pra you get some practice on how to go about this. This time I'm going to do the analysis within our commander itself. In other words, I'm going to read the data from within our commander itself. That is something we've probably not looked at earlier. So I'm going to say data, import data from text file. And let's say I want to call the resulting data set. This is the variable into which you're going to load the data. I'm just going to call it as, uh, whatever, we can call it just as data or dat. I'm going to call it a dat. And then we know that we are going to use a comma separated variable. So the separator is comma. And I can now say, okay. And it'll ask me where the file is. And I'm going to say the file is percentile.csv. And it has read it. So it says the data set has 50 rows and one columns, which is right. That's what it has. So now all we want is to do a data summary. So I can do statistics, summaries for the active data set. Why not? And it shows me the summary. They had only one column. It says the minimum is 793. The first quartile, which is the 25th percentile, is 917.2. The median is 993. The mean, which we didn't want in this example, is 987. The third quartile or the 75th percentile is 1052.5 and the maximum is 1175. Okay, so that is how you would have done it with our commander. Uh, you can do it, of course, in Excel by following the instructions that I had given earlier. You'll get pretty much the same results. 
So this is the result that we got by doing it within our commander. You would have got similar results if you had done it using anything else. Let's move on to a different topic, topic of frequency distributions. Quite often, just looking at how the data are distributed gives us a good idea of what kind of analyses we can perform. So for example, uh, there's a date, some data sets here, two data sets. One is uh, the years of college. This is information about two different cities and they've con they conducted surveys of people and they want to look at for uh, each person, how many years of college they have studied. In the first city, they found that of the sample that they took, 35 people had not gone to college, 21 people had done one year, 24 people had done two years, etc., etc. And in the second city, things were very different. 187 people had not done any college, and uh, 62 people had done one year, 34 people had done two years, and so on and so forth. Okay, so the two cities might be having a very different kind of a profile of college attendance. On the other hand, it could it could be quite similar. We don't know yet. Uh, for example, the number of people surveyed in the second city may be larger, and that is why some of these numbers could be larger. Right? We need to take a look at this more closely to find out exactly what the differences or similarities between these two are. So that's an example of a frequency distribution. Right? You take different values. For every value, you find out how many observations fall in that value. You could either look at frequency distributions or you could look at relative frequency distributions. The difference between the two is that in frequency distributions, you're giving for every level the actual number of data observations at that level. In frequency, relative frequency distributions, instead of giving the actual number, you're giving the relative proportion of observations which fall there. So for example, in the city one, years of college was uh, 35 people had zero years of college. Now those 35 people compri comprised roughly 21.9% of the total population surveyed. Okay. In the second city, it was 56.7% of the people did not go to any college. So if you remember, when we looked at just the frequency distribution, actual absolute numbers, we couldn't get a really quick idea of how different these two populations were, right? Remember, I speculated that maybe you're seeing a high number simply because the total number of people surveyed was high or whatever. You didn't get a very good idea of the, dis of the distributions and how they differed. Whereas when you look at the relative frequency distributions, you get a good idea that these two populations are pretty different. Okay, so that's the benefit of relative frequency distributions when comparisons become a lot easier. With absolute numbers, you may not always be able to compare, but with relative numbers, comparisons become a lot easier. Another example. So here is the data on the inactive periods of the old, old faithful geyser in the Yellowstone National Park. Right? You might be familiar with the fact that uh, the, there's a a steam geyser in Yellowstone National Park and it keeps erupting at periodic intervals. Now what you're seeing here is the number of minutes it was inactive between successive eruptions. So the gap. So let's say that the first 42, what it says is the fountain uh, erupted and then it stopped and after 42 minutes again it erupted, then it stopped and after 51 minutes it erupted again it stopped and so on and so forth. So inactive periods of the old faithful uh, steam geyser in the Yellowstone National Park. So one thing, it's one thing to look at data like this, just as raw numbers. Now, if when you look at it just like this, in terms of all these numbers, it's very difficult for us to form an impression of what this, inf what information or intelligence is contained in this. For example, we don't know what is the most common uh, inactive period. Is it 40s? Is it in the 50s? Is it 70, 80? We don't know which is the most common occurrence. We don't know the average. We don't know the median. None of those things. One way to get your hands around these kinds of numbers is to plot what is called as a histogram, a frequency histogram. 
So in this case, what we're seeing is for every minute between 40 and let's say 95, which is the range of data here, minimum is roughly 40, it's 42, and maximum was close to 95. Let's see where that is. 93. In fact, the data is actually sorted 42, 45, 49, 50, 51, 51, 51, etc. Okay, but once you plot it in a frequency histogram, then you get a much better idea of what it's all about. So it says, for example, between 40 and 45, there were only two observations, right? The height of this bar tells you how many observations. And between 45 and 50, there were two observations. Whereas between 50 and 55, there were eight observations and so on. Okay, so this gives us a good idea of how the relative inactive periods are actually distributed. We know that between 40 and 50, there are very few cases. And similarly, above 90 are also very few cases. The most frequently occurring are between 50 and 55 and 70, 75, 70 to let's say 80 or even 90. Okay, so that gives us a pictorial idea of how the information, uh, the data is actually distributed. So that's a histogram. So in this case, I'm showing another different histogram of uh, data or some scores, SAT kind of scores, I suppose. And you see the distribution. Once again, the range is between, let's say, 750 and 1200. That's the whole range. But you see that the most common score is close to 1000 to 1100 or you could even say 950 to 1100 contains the most number of values so you can see one histogram that looks like this and given a histogram you can answer various kinds of questions how many scores are between 900 and 1000 okay so you've got 900 here you've got 1000 here so number of scores between 900 and 1000 is going to be 7 which is between 900 and 950 and 10 between 950 and 1000 so the total is going to be 17. Similarly you can say how many scores were less than 1000 you could count them all so less than 1000 is going to be 10 plus 7 plus 5 plus 4 plus 1 okay and you get 44. So histograms give us a good idea of the shape of a distribution. So here you see some examples, the same data I have plotted in the form of histograms. What difference? It's exactly the same data, but what is different between each of these? Well, the difference is that the number of bins that I have used is different in each case. Now, if you look at a histogram, then after all, what we are doing is we are saying how many values fall into a particular range, right? So this range represents 800 to 850. And we are saying between 800 and 850, there are four values. Now, who told us that we need to have a range of 50? Why not a range of 100? Why not a range of 200? Why not a range of 1? So it's possible that we could use any of those kinds of things. So the, the individual intervals into which we divide a histogram are called bins. And here, what, we don't, what we've done is plotted the same information with different bin sizes. The range is still the same. The minimum and maximum, the range is the same. But the bin sizes are all pretty different. And you can see how bin sizes have a big impact on the shape of how a histogram looks. So it's important to choose a reasonable bin size that gives you a good idea of the shape. In this particular case, I would think that this one, the third one, is the optimal bin size that allows us to see their underlying shape. The fourth one probably has too much detail and it shows us all kinds of variations which may not be significant. And the top two don't have enough information. They're not giving us information about the shape at all. Okay, so uh, the, the whole point I'm making here is that the bin size in a histogram 
plays a very important role. It's important. So you may need to experiment a little bit when drawing histograms to get an idea about the data. Another piece of information that you look at when you look at distributions is that sometimes you'll find data distributed very uniformly. Okay, that is, it looks more or less symmetrical. So if you, let's go back to our previous examples. So here, the histogram is sort of symmetrical. It's not completely symmetrical because it doesn't look exactly the same on either side of the maximum, but it's sort of symmetrical. You can see there's some degree of symmetry to this. And same thing was true with, with this as well, some degree of symmetry, except that for some strange reason, there were no values between 60 and 70. Okay. Now, this may not be completely symmetrical because you see that there's a peak here and a peak here. Now, this kind of a distribution is called as a bimodal distribution where there are two peaks but often you will find distributions that have just one peak and uh, there's decreased values on either side of the peak. Okay. So sometimes what you'll see is that when you look at the distribution of values, you may find that there are more values, many more values to the left of the peak than to the right of the peak. Or you might find many more values to the right of the peak than to the left of the peak. Or you may find equal number of values on both sides of the peak, approximately equal number of values on both sides. Okay. When this happens, when there are more values on the left side, that is called as a left skewed distribution. The other one is called the right skewed, recalled as right skewed distribution. When the distribution is left skewed, the mean will tend to be less than the median. Right? Because the median is the middle value and uh, the middle value will occur somewhere here. Okay, And it will be the other way in this case. <clears throat> in the case of a symmetric distribution, the mean and median will be very close together. So it's only in the case of symmetric distributions that the mean actually is a useful measure of central tendency. When there's asymmetry, it's better to use the median as an indicator of uh, central tendency. So let's see how to do histograms in Excel, in Stat Plus, and in R. In R Commander, you can select the data set or read it in and then just select graphs, histogram, in Excel, you can read in the data, do data, data analysis, histogram. And uh, you can either leave the bin range as blank. In Excel, there's an option called bin range. You can leave it blank or you can specify the range, select chart output, uh, and so on. Okay, and then you can specify the actual bin range would be something like this. You'll put in the values and then give that as the range for bin range. You'll see that when you actually run it in Excel. In Stat Plus, once again, you do the same thing. Open Stat Plus, let it keep running. Then you open the file in Excel, go back to Stat Plus, select Statistics, Basic Statistics and Tables, Descriptive Statistics, Histogram, and then OK, and then select the data range in Excel and wait, and uh, it plots the histogram. OK, so those are things I'm not actually giving you a demo. You will be able to do it yourself. Just experiment, play around, and figure out how to do that. <clears throat> 